again that uh, uh, celebration day and you know the first is Bhikkhu Sangyodin uh, one Sangyodin comes in 2026 uh, and uh, of course there is uh, Puja and then we got a couple of uh, a couple of anniversaries and the first one is uh, as I said uh, the first one is Kurt in Angela Kurtzang that is that is for for, for nine years and then it's me and my wife, Mary. Yeah. We, we also been married for nine years. And the third, so. Well done, Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I married a lovely wife. I told you last night again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very privileged. So, uh, yeah, she, she, uh, that's everything that I, I pray as well. And I'm so lovely for that. So, yeah, I'm very blessed. Married for nine years, and uh, yeah, so next next year's a big year. <laughs> look at some big years, and then uh, then on the sixth is uh, look at look out my dear, uh, I'm very happy uh, about all you guys, and then uh, the kids are down at Studio Seven, so uh, they run all the school programs. The holidays are approaching, but uh, they're still going through school and books. So I just want to remind you guys to take them down and pick them up. The service is over, you guys can have your big chat down there, so we'll, we'll support them in that way. And then uh, I think that's, uh, that's it for me. Uh, Owens will be giving you the word this morning, and we can pray for him, and then we'll get into the word together. Amen. Good. So I don't know if you realized it was very quiet this morning when you came in. And uh, although there's problems, I just felt that thing of sometimes we, we might even feel like we're in a, in a quiet, parched land, like we, we've got that quiet. And it's also a space where God speaks to us. So sometimes we get so used to the busyness and the hub and the, the buzz that we forget to just get quiet in front of God. And just listen to him as well. So it was maybe intentional as well. <laughs> God has his ways of working with us. But this morning, um, I'm really excited to share something about um, faith, fellowship, and fire this morning. So I'm, I'm busy just reading through the Gospel of Matthew. And, and as I'm reading through the Gospel at the end, I'm, I'm just um, was so sensitized as, at what Jesus went through at the end. And, and not just what he went through, but also how we often just read over some of the portions of Scripture because we know the portion of Scripture or because it's become familiar to us. Like, yeah, we know what's going to happen. It's like when you've got kids and you watch Lion King for the 20th time. You know what's going to happen. You almost shut off and you like just phase through. And, and I, I was sensitized to that. Like, let's not read Scripture and become so, so familiar with it that we just pass over scriptures and, and keep on asking God for, for what he's got for us out of the fresh word every time. And, um, and as I was reading, um, you know, these disciples, I don't know what emotions they went through in those last few days there in the, in the Gospels. They went from highs to lows with Jesus to running away from Jesus to... That their emotions and what they went through must have been haywire. And then 
Then we read about this guy, Peter. We all know Peter. And I find myself saying, thank you, Jesus, that there's somebody like Peter in the Word that we can learn from and that we can actually relate to. I don't know about you, but I relate a lot with Peter, the, the things that he went through, from being so sure and being so certain, saying things to Jesus, to the next moment denying him and running away, and then again standing up and speaking to 3,000, and then again saying, no, I don't want to do the Gentile thing, and he was flip-flop, this and that. But we can relate with that, because we're human, and he was human as well. So, so I love the way Peter also went from a lot of uncertainties to, uns uh, to certainties. Like, he, he knew eventually what was the certain things that he could stand on. So the scripture, I've actually just got one scripture to preach from today, but we'll expound a bit about it. But turn your Bibles to Matthew 26, verse 58. So Matthew 26, verse 58 is probably one of those verses that we read over and move to the next portion. And you, we sort of don't stop for a moment with this verse. So, so let me read it to you, and I'll share what I just got out of this. So it says, but Peter followed, so this is after Jesus was caught, and they were taking him to the, to the high priest for, for his trial, and um, it says, Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard at the, of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. So the uh, di different gospels, the other gospels, also share the exact same scripture but just in different ways and in mark it also speaks about at the end he sat with the guards to warm himself at the fire so you can imagine this picture like jesus is being taken into the the court a uh, high court and then peter at a distance he doesn't want to get too close it's almost like you're a spy and you follow a car you don't want to get too close he's going to know you there so you stay at a distance and then he gets there and he sits with other people, the guards, so that he can blend in with the crowd, so he doesn't stand out. And then we see he also wants a bit of warmth, so maybe it was a bit cold that evening. But from this scripture, I just got a few things, because problems come. It's what's one of those certainties. Problems will come. And what do we do when problems come? Like Peter, this was a problem for him, and this is what he did. He stayed at a distance, he sat with the other people, and then problems for us might look very different. For some of us, COVID might have been a problem. For others, the economy is a problem. For others, work is a problem. For others, marriages might be problems. You see, problems can look very different to different people. So, so there's no one thing that we can say is a problem. It's going to be different things, but it's what we do when problems arise. So hopefully we learn something from, from Peter because we learn a lot of good things from Peter and we learn a lot of bad things from Peter as well. So this is one of those areas that we're going to learn from him. So, so I've, I found five things in the scripture that, that I want to just uh, open up a bit. And the first thing is when problems come, we don't want to follow Jesus at a distance. You see, Peter followed him at a distance from that moment and when problems arise, especially when there's problems, we need to be close to Jesus. That's the time we need, we need to be crying out for help, saying, Jesus, help us. That's the time where we need to be pressing in with him and, and looking for his presence. It's not the time for us to then stay at a distance and hope things work out for the better. So if you anything like me, we, we tend to look like we, we tend to look at problems or, or something task at hand and we automatically evaluate the task and you say this is a task yeah i think i've got the, the capability i think i've got the skill so let's go ahead or otherwise we say yeah i'm not sure if i've got the capability let me hang back and see if somebody else can do it first and let me hang back and see if it doesn't just fix itself <laughs> we often do that eh <laughs> and um and based on what we evaluate, then, then we only pursue this thing. So, so we, we like to just take a little bit of distance from a, from a situation. And, um, and I think in this scenario, Jesus was probably going through the most difficult thing in his life. And Peter, one of his 
the right hand man chooses to stand at a distance and he chooses not to be with Jesus almost, I want to say. It's like, you, you want to be with a guy who's going through something difficult like that. And then this Christian walk that we are in, it, it's not something that God wants us to walk alone. He wants us to walk with him because only with him is going to be the, the certainty of it. Um, just love the way that Jana shared this morning about faith. We, we live by faith and not by sight because it's exactly that thing. Peter was trying to, to see things first and see how it plays out before he's going to take a step of boldness and say, this is what I stand for. And this road of faith, this, this Christian walk, is not something that we can do just on our own abilities. So in Hebrews 11 verse 8, it says a uh, well-known portion of, of faith that, that speaks about Abram. And I love the way it says, It was by faith that Abram obeyed God when, called, uh, when God called him to, to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. And just see that last bit. He went without knowing where he was going. Like, what? Abram didn't know where he was going. Like, pack up your things and go. Where, God? No, I don't know yet, but just go. Like, no, God, I, I have to wait for the rain first. No, I have to wait. Where's the, where's the new place? Is there going to be schools for my kids? Is there going to be place for my cattle? And None of that. He packs up and he goes. Without knowing where, he just goes. That's faith. And often we just want to remain in the distance saying, wait, wait, Jesus, if the economy turns, I'll, I'll maybe do this. If this happens, I'll do that. We've got a lot of ifs with God, eh? You know why Abram can do that? Because he had ro walked a road with, with God that, that, that showed him God's faithfulness. And out of the history of God's faithfulness, he, he could obey God like this. Because he had seen God be faithful in the past, and it was easy for him to just do it again. Because he wasn't so much worried about the promise that was there or the going or the, 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 the what, what God said. He was more focused on God who was the promise maker. And he trusted God, so therefore he can trust anything that God says. Yo, I, sometimes we look at scripture and say, God, what were you thinking with this portion? Actually, it's not about the portion. It's about God, and we trust God. Therefore, we can trust the Word. Whole Word, the whole counsel of God. It's not just the nice parts. So we can say that's about Abram. What about us? It's sort of unique. But Ephesians 2 verse 10, God speaks about very specific things about us. And it's addressed to us as believers. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Long ago, he planned this road for us to walk. And not walk it alone, walk it with him. And as we walk with him, he's going to help us to grow, help us in faith. And he doesn't leave us alone. Um, I love speaking about the Holy Spirit because he comes alongside us and he does it with us. He's our friend, he's our counselor, he's our advocate, he's our parakletos, the one who comes alongside and helps us. He doesn't want us to do this alone. He wants to be tucked in with us. And that's where our primary fellowship lies, is with God, yeah. with Jesus. We have to have our fellowship with Jesus first because before we can do anything else with anybody else. If I'm struggling to have fellowship with anybody else, I need to go look at my own life and my fellowship with Jesus. How am I doing with my fellowship with Jesus? Am I at a distance with him? Or am I right up there, drawing near to him? So Peter was at a distance. The next thing that, that stood out for me is, when problems come, we don't want to come up to the courtyard only. The, he went to the temple, and he came up to the courtyard only. So obviously there was law still in place there, and Peter just couldn't walk into the Holy of Holies. There was a curtain there. So that's a practical issue. But when you think spiritually about this, don't we often do that? When problems come, we only come to the outer court. We only come to the courtroom 
uh, uh, courtyard, and we never go in to the Holy of Holies where we actually access the grace of God. It's a, I don't know if you saw a statement like this, but somewhere in the lockdown, the Catholics actually made a statement that said, during lockdown time, the Catholics could confess their sins directly to God for the season. <laughs> but after lockdown, they had to go back to a priest again. How shocking is that? We've got access to the Holy of Holies. Not just once a year, every day, every moment. Sure, Jesus, help us. We don't want to just have permission every now and again to, to speak to you, to confess. And it's not just about the confessing. I think that's also the major thing that blows my mind. It's not about confessing, it's about relationship. If we only go to Jesus without confessing sins, then we're missing the plot as well. Then we're missing that relationship that he wants with us. So Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 20. This is a lot in the scripture. It says, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, other translation speaks about boldness, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, not by what we've done, how nice we were, it says, by a new living way he opened for us through the curtain. That is his body. You know, the curtain was there separating the Holy of Holies from, from us. But that's no longer the issue. Now the curtain is torn. Jesus did it. By the blood of Jesus, we can enter. Then he goes on and says, Since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and full of assurance with faith, that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. There's a lot there, but we've got a high priest that is not like Aaron that would die. We've got the eternal high priest, and that's Jesus. Yeah. He's forever going to intercede on our behalf, and he's not going to stop. We can enter with confidence, access the throne room of God for the grace that we need every day. But, what, but we settle for the courtyard. And I'd I actually don't have a picture for this, but, but you know how the temple looked in the middle was the Holy of Holies, and then just before that was the Holy, holy um, Room, and there was the, the bread and the candlestick, and all those things were in there, and then where the priest would go in and do sacrifice, and th then on the outside was the courtyard of the priest, and this is where they were, and fascinating, that courtyard had a few things in there. It first had the, the, the altar of sacrifice there. So that's where they would sacrifice the animal, sprinkle the blood, that's for the forgiveness of sins, and then from there they moved on to this, this brass, uh, bronze laver, this basin that was so shiny, filled with water. And the, the priest would have to go from the sprinkling of the blood, they would go there and they would have to wash their hands and feet before they could go into the holy place. Incredible picture here. As we draw closer to God, it's based on the sacrifice on the altar, which was Jesus. And it's based on the washing of the word, washing of the living water. And that's how we enter the most holy. You know, the, 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 the bronze laver, the basin, was also a type and shadow and a picture of, of a mirror that you go look into. So as you wash, you see yourself, you see your reflection. And it's almost like just looking at yourself before you go to God. It's like a reflection of who am I? And then realizing this is, the, I'm, I'm a child of God and I can go into this place. You know, the, the washing of the word, Jesus is the living water. He says, anybody who drinks from me won't be thirsty again. I just want to add in this context, anybody who washes with this water won't be dirty again. There's I love the way it says, it cleanses us from a guilty conscience. We don't go into the Holy of Holies with a guilty conscience. If any of us here this morning feel something of that guilty conscience, Jesus, may we be reminded that you have washed us. That your blood has cleansed us from this guilty conscience. 
And no longer do we only come up to the courtyard, but we go into the throne room. We go into the Holy of Holies, and we've got access to the Father. That's where our fellowship lies. But it's by faith. So the third thing that stood out for me is when trouble comes, we don't want to see the outcome first. We want to be people of faith, not waiting on an outcome before we step out in faith, because then it's not faith anymore. It's, it's, it's because of seeing I go. It's not because of faith I go. Um, so it's ridiculous. Peter just cut off the ear of this, the soldier, and then he runs away, and then he comes. I think Peter was so confused about what he himself believed about Jesus that if somebody had to ask him that moment, that's why he said, no, I don't know Jesus. But deep inside, he actually did. And he was just so unsure. And I think for me as well, it's sometimes we ourselves don't even know what we think about something. And then if somebody asks you, you're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> and you want to wait and see the outcome first. You want to see how somebody else does it first or reacts. Um, it was funny, the other day we, we made sushi with a couple of friends and and you know it's a, if it's your first time you you don't want to just make sushi because you don't know and you sort of wait and you see how others do it and then when you when they see when you see that you, then you do it the same way you sort of want to copy them so you wait wait for everybody else and then you do it or if, if in a class somebody uh, asks who wants to go first nobody wants to go first because you want to see how somebody else does it first because that sets a benchmark for who else it follows you understand so we don't want to wait, be a people that wait for outcome before we step out in faith. And yes, it's an uncertain time in economy, uncertain time in jobs, uncertain times in the world, the, the borders. Everything is uncertain. That's why we need to stand on something that is certain. We need to be standing firm. And that's, that's only on Jesus. And I'm not saying ignore the economy, ignore everything. There's wisdom in, in looking at these things. Financial people will look at them. It, it, there's wisdom in that, but we can't rely on that and place our hope in that. There's, a, there's such a big difference in placing our faith and our hope in things that are uncertain. In Psalms 2 verse 1 to 4, such a key scripture, I think, for for everything that's going on in the world even now. It says, Why do nations conspire and people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord and against the anointed. And then they say, Let's break the chains, throw off the shackles. And then verse 4 just settles everything in our hearts because it says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs and he scoffs. The Lord scoffs at them. Jesus is enthroned. He is seated. He is in control. He is not worried about things going on. We are worried. We look at things big-eyed. But Jesus doesn't. And you know, nations can make plans. People can plot. But it's God's plan who, in His will that prevails. Our faith is in Jesus, the one who is enthroned. And you know what? Our faith and what our actions, the outcome that we need to be looking at, has already been achieved on the cross. That's the only outcome we need to base our decisions on. And more than the cross, three days later, the resurrection, that's the outcome that we look for. Because that's where he overcame death. Our hope is not in earthly things, it's in eternal things, it's in Jesus. Luke 21 verse 19 says, Stand firm and you will win life. That stand firm means stand firm in Jesus on what his word says. 1 Corinthians 16 says the same thing, and it encourages us. It says, be on your guard. I love the way it says that, and then stand firm in the faith. Because we, we're not ignorant about what's going on in the world. Be on guard. We look at the things. We look at economy. We look at what's going on in the world. We are on guard. But we're not basing our decisions on that, and we're not basing our outcomes on that. We stand firm in the faith, be courageous in these times, be strong, and do everything in love. That's the way we want to stand in Jesus. The 
there's no outcome we need to look at other than what Jesus has done. Oftentimes we we want to we wa- we don't want to step out and and uh, and share scripture with somebody or pray for somebody because we want to see the outcome first. We've got a lot of ifs again. Like I've done it as well. I've I've said to God, okay, I'm I'm going into the shop, but I'll pray for somebody if they start speaking to me or if they bring up X, Y, and Z. Then I know it's a sign I can pray for them. But that's my if. (laughs) That's my condition, and I'm waiting for that outcome before I'm going to take a step of faith. Peter had to bump his head three times before he realized he could take the step of faith. Next thing is, when problems come, we, we sit, we want to sit with Jesus. We don't want to sit with others. And this is a, a thing that goes both ways because our primary fellowship is with Jesus. But we need fellowship with each other because who we sit with is greatly important because they're going to influence me. Those you surround yourselves with will influence you. Whether you like it or not, good or bad, they they will influence you. So who we surround ourselves with is vital. And you know what Peter did? Is he went and he sat with the gods, and I don't think the gods influenced him in a good way. Because <laughs> when, he's, when he's asked about Jesus, he denies them. That means he wasn't influenced in a good way. And as we spend time with people in a good way, in, in fellowship, we're going to grow. And as we grow, we're going to realize our need for fellowship more. And we're going to realize our need to influence others more. Because oftentimes we come to the party thinking, what can I get out of this? How can I benefit from this relationship or this fellowship? Instead of coming to the party and saying, how can I add benefit? To this fellowship and I think something of lockdown has really highlighted the fact that we need fellowship and and at some fundamental level for every one of us we need fellowship some of us maybe have enjoyed the quiet time the downtime the the isolation some some personalities will do well for that with that for a while but then we still realize we need that we made to be together. That's the body. We're better together. And it's available for all of us because it's just the invitation away. Just the invitation away. Easy to invite one or two people. Um, and you want to wanna be in close fellowship, but not too close. 1.5 meters is advised. <laughs> but we want to be fellowship. Fellowship can't happen at a distance. Fellowship needs to happen here. And it's easy. If, if I don't get invited, then I invite. <laughs> we, so, we so super spiritualize this and we so super complicate this. It's easy. If I don't get invited, let's turn the tables and I invite somebody. And as soon as you do that, I think you're going to realize just that quickly how much we are the same and how much we relate to the same thing. Because everyone has got stuff. Everyone has got stuff. And the, the sooner we realize that in fellowship, the sooner we realize there's no judgment for each other in that. Because everyone has got stuff. We don't come together so that we can compare and judge. We come together so that we can grow together and love one another. Do everything in love. Proverbs 17 verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times. That's why you want a friend. To love you at all times and never judge you for things that you've done. There's nothing as bad as somebody saying to you how bad they feel about something and you confirming it with them and saying, yeah, that's terrible. (laughs) (laughs) That's terrible. That is terrible to say that. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Brothers and sisters in fellowship are there for times of adversity. Was lockdown a time of adversity? Yes. That's why we need brothers and sisters. 
Does it mean that lockdown is over? We don't need this anymore? No, we need it more. <laughs> and we learn from Peter that who we sit with will influence our decision making, our words, our character. You realize that uh, at school it's the worst because when you spend time with a new bunch of friends, it, it's, it's not even two or three weeks and you start speaking the same way, you speak the same slang, the same language, good or bad language, doesn't matter, you speak the same. It doesn't take long to adapt to that. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, don't be misled, bad company corrupts good character. We might go into that group with the best intention saying, I'm this little light, I'm going to go in and I'm going to shine and I'm going to change them all. Good intentions, but bad company corrupts your good character. And in a negative sense, this goes two ways, because who I'm with is going to influence me. But also, who I'm with, I'm going to influence them. And somewhere in the end, we're going to stand in front of Jesus and he's going to say, how did you influence that person? And there's a responsibility for us about how we influence others. And I want to stand before Jesus one day and hear, wow, you influenced that guy. That, that was good. And it, it's not by being super spiritual, guys. It's being ourselves, being who we are in Jesus, standing firm, being in fellowship with Jesus and being in fellowship with each other. And through that, we can influence other people. I just love the way this morning, even with no music, people come in and you see, this one praying for that one, this one praying for that one. That's fellowship. That's what we need. Earlier this week, I, I it's not you, Tex. Um, earlier this week, I bumped my nail in the car door. It slammed in there. So, so that was really sore initially. It's still sore, but it was really sore on the nail at that moment. It was thumping. And you know then, it's not even two hours later, and the, the, the thumb's joint is now sore, this joint becomes sore, later the wrist is like stiff, and you like want to move the hole in the hand. It's like everything is now stiff. It was just the thumbnail, but now everything is stiff. That's how the body works. One hurt, it influences the next one. And the reality is, friends, hurt people hurt others. Let's not be the hurting ones that hurt others. Let's be the good joints coming in and saying, hey, thumb, let's help you for the season and let's get you back on track again. I see this so often just with physio. You see it. People come in and say, no, a month ago I hurt my back, but now it's a month later and the hip is sore and the knee is sore. Everything is now sore because it's compensating and one joint starts off and you end up with the whole body that's being painful. For the sake of the body and for His glory, let's sort out our hurts. I'm not saying there is hurts. If there is any, we want to sort them out. Because it's not for the helpful for the body. It's not for His glory. We need to be in fellowship, in relationship with one another. We need to allow one another to come alongside each other and, and help each other. And I want to be careful. I don't know if you can put that Matthew scripture on again. And I want to be careful that I don't sit on the outside with the guards, if you, if you hear what I'm saying. It says that uh, sat down with the guards, but sat with the guards on the outside. That's the courtyard. I don't want to sit on the outside in the courtyard with the guards. Because I'm outside, I want to be inside with Jesus, close to him. I don't want to sit with the guards, I want to sit with Jesus, and I want to sit with like-minded people who can help me grow in Jesus. And it's not to say you can't speak to anybody else who's not a believer. Please, no. We, we don't want to be this holy idol. We, uh, this, the, one guy, Tony Seyfried, he leads a church in Joburg. He says he loves every now and again being around people and hearing a swear, swear word. 
because then it means he's in the right place, he's with the right people to influence. He says he doesn't want to be with him the whole time, but he wants to be with him so he can reach the lost and the dying world. But he's there to influence them. But he goes back to fellowship because that's where we grow, so that we can go out and influence and come back and grow. And go out and influence and come back and grow. And then the last one is when problems come, I don't want to sit at other fires. I want to sit at the fire with Jesus. You know, the other gospel speaks about he sat with them at the fire for warmth. And I mean, sometimes we are cold and we need warmth. But we go look for warmth in all the other fires that is temporary and has got these short-lived promises. And it won't last. We need to sit with the fire, with the body, that like-minded people. Because when we with like-minded people, we, we're actually adding fuel to the fire. You know that um, one coal on its own, one log piece of wood burning on its own, it's okay, but add them together and we can make this massive bonfire. And it's not to say there's not other fires. There is other fires. But when we commit to this fire, we can make this a big fire for Jesus. <laughs> and there's earthly fires, in a way, and they promise a lot of things, but that's the fires that won't last. And then there's the fire of Jesus, the church that he wants to be burning for him. That's the fire that we want to be part of. You see, it's a, we can do it in, in two ways. When we come to the fire, we can be the piece of log or the burning wood that comes needing warmth. So then I come for the benefit of getting warmth from a fire that's already there. Okay? And that's necessary for some to get the warmth. But then I can also come with a fire and say, there's a fire that I can add value to, fuel to the fire. And then we add value to the fire for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of kingdom. The one has got a benefit for me, and the one has got a benefit for the others, for kingdom. So Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16 Jesus says to us, you are the light of the world, a town or a city built on a hill that cannot be hidden. That's the fire that we, he wants us to be, the church, that, that's on a, on a hill that cannot be hidden for people to see miles away. Neither do people light the lamp and put it under a bowl or hide it. Instead, they put it in, uh, uh, on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Then they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Why do we need to shine our lights? We're not doing the good deeds for the sake of good deeds. But again, it, it encourages us here to say, let your light shine so others may see it. Why? To praise you, to say, well done, tap me on the shoulder. No, it says, so that others may see it and glorify the Father. That's the goal of being a fire together. And as, as the church glorifies Jesus, the fire gets bigger and bigger, and it cannot be hidden. Now, I want to be part of that fire that raised my hand and said, I want to be part of this thing. There's this, um, you know, we don't always get it right. We're human like Peter, but we press on to, to reach there. Like Peter, we're human. We're not always going to be there, but let's press on. Uh, I just love the example of Esther and, um, and how she came and raised her hand in that moment. And I know uh, a lot of people think Esther is just for women's conferences. No, it's not. This is powerful for all of us. Because listen to this, Esther 4 verse 12. Um, you know, we know there was a problem with, uh, uh, they wanted to kill the Jews. And then um, Esther said, what can I do about this? 
And then Mordecai gave these wise words to her. Um, he, he sent back the answer and he says, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for, for Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And he says, And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That's for all of us. Let's not think just because we are safe, we have a little bit of finance, we have a little bit of shelter, we have, we have some things that think that we are safe. Just because we have that doesn't, think, doesn't mean we're going to be safe. Just think of that Psalm 2, that scripture where it says nations and, and people plot and then they plot against God himself and the anointed. Who's the anointed? It's all. That means they're going to be ugly to us. They're going to they're gonna say things to us. They're going to do things to us. But God sits enthroned and he laughs at them. This means we, we might not escape this thing. But the encouragement is if we remain silent, you, you know, we can remain silent. We can do nothing and be passive. God will just find somebody else. Somebody else, and we have missed out on the rewards in heaven in that moment. You know, somebody that didn't have a choice like this was Jesus. Imagine if he had become silent at the end and said, Oh, Jesus uh, of God, I can't do this. I mean, he said, if, if it's possible, let it pass, this cup. And it wasn't possible because there was nobody that could replace him. Help would not arise from another place in Jesus' case. With us, if we remain silent, God will use somebody else. <coughs> but I want to be Esther that raise my hand, come to the party, come to the fire and say, I want to be part of this thing. And who knows, we, we are here for such a time as this. Maybe we're seated in the seats this morning for such a time as this. For we, we live in Uppington for such a time as this. We're going somewhere to a different place for such a time as this. And we are in a royal position, all of us. It wasn't just Esther. This is a type and shadow of us being in a royal priesthood of believers. Who knows that we are who we are, where we are for such a time as this. God really desires us to, to live in fellowship with him, in fellowship with each other. And it's done by faith. And that's, I think that's why I just wanted to say this thing of it's faith, fellowship, and fire. When we live in faith in our relationship with Jesus, live in fellowship with him and the fellowship with each other, there's going to be a fire. It's sort of a natural involvement. When there's faith, there's going to be fellowship, and with fellowship, there's going to be fire. Trusting for that. Just the last scripture to encourage us with, out of Hebrews 10, verse 23. And it says, Let us unswervingly, um, hold, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I just felt that for the season as well for us. We, we need to be focused on who Jesus is, glorify Jesus, and it has to be focused purely on him. It's not swervingly. You know how a car looks that, that's just gone out of control, swerves this way and this way across the road. It's, it's not in control. You, you're not sure which way to go. But when we unswervingly hold on to the hope, it means we are fixed on this one spot. It's like men. We can be single tasked and we do that one thing. There's no swerving this side and that way. It's focused on Jesus. And it says, for he who promised is faithful. Because God is faithful, it doesn't matter what the promise is, I'm going to trust it. Because he made it. In this season, we need to be unswervingly holding on to Jesus, focusing on Him. And 
just the, I just want to leave an encouragement for us as well, that, that thing about invitation. It sounds so silly. If I'm not invited, then I'll invite. It's like, if, if nobody has invited you, I'm trusting it, it, somebody will invite you. But if nobody has invited you in the next two or three weeks, then you invite somebody. Don't feel bad. Somebody will say yes. And if somebody is busy the first time, ask somebody else. Don't give up. <laughs> we know some people, we, we're busy. That's fine. Keep asking. Keep knocking. Somebody will come. <laughs> and just um, this morning, praying for, for today as well, just felt out of this thing, um, this, this word of strong, strong and weak, that, that some people, even this morning, may be feeling that they're weak, that they, they need something of a refreshing. They, they're weak and they don't know how they're going to do the next, let alone month, this, this week. Like, how am I going to take on this week? I don't even see the answer for this week, let alone a month. And maybe if you're in that position of feeling weak, I want to encourage you that God says, when you are weak, you feel strong. You are strong in me. Just the strength that God wants to encourage us this week with, that it's, it's based on Him. And let's stand firm in Him, because then we will win life. Just love the way Scripture makes it so clear. So I want to pray for us and just trust that we live strongly in, in our faith in Him, live in our fellowship with Him, primarily with Him and then with others as well. And then just reminded of the fire that we need to be together. Yeah, Lord, I want to thank you, Jesus, that you are good. You are good even when we don't know, when we don't know what we're thinking, when we don't know what we're believing. You are still good, Lord Jesus. Lord, I want to pray that we step out in faith, enter and access the throne room with, with boldness, Lord Jesus. Because there we find life, there we find hope. And in you we find the grace we need, the strength we need for the very life that you've prepared for us long ago. Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of us. As, as we even feel weak, I, I want to pray a strength, a refreshing of strength this morning. That, the, that there's, there won't be a relying on sight this morning, but a relying firmly on you, the promise maker, and faith in you. Thank you, Jesus, that, that you give your spirit, and I pray that your spirit just settles in our hearts now, that you love us, that you've got, you've got intentions and plans for us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good, thank you, Lawrence. Um, that's it. Good, thank you, Lawrence. Yeah, what a great encouragement for us this morning. Um, always find that the truth strengthens and encourages us. So, so thank you for that, Lawrence. So Lumi just has a word that she wants to share with us. So while Lawrence was sharing, um, I just got this word. It says, and God was just saying, speak out, speak out, speak out. And I just believe, just in line with what Lawrence said, some of us might feel weak this morning. Some of us might just feel like you're in need of something. There's, you've just got so much on your heart. And I believe God is saying, speak out. Just speak it out. And the scripture is in John 4 where God um, um, speaks to the Samaritan woman. And he says to her, it's uh, actually ironic. He, he first asks her for a drink. But then he says, without um, uh, responding, he says, well, if you knew what I've got for you, you would ask me and I will give you. He's standing right next to her. He could have just given her everything. But he says to her, ask me and I will give you. And I just believe God is saying, Whatever is on your heart, whatever you're thinking about, whatever this speech has stirred in your heart, ask, come out, speak out, and he will give. And, you know, there's so many people here this morning, speak out to someone. And I believe God's word says, he promised us, he will give. He says it. If you ask, I will give, and you will become fresh, will bubble with, with life inside of you. That's a good invitation. So if there's any one of you guys who in that space, I think we'll leave some time for free um, after we, we're done here. So uh, we'll stay here at the front and, and pray pray with you guys who 
can uh, relate to that word. And then uh, also, also, also Dirk has his last Sunday with us. So, so we're going to gather here at the front and just, just pray, pray with him. Uh, so I want to invite you guys, if you have anything in your heart, just ask. Or if you don't have, even ask God for a word for him. So we want to want to leave him with a blessing. I think Dirk, it's been uh, six, five years, five years uh, that Dirk has been with us. So uh, so he's so he's found a job in Darling, and uh, and he'll be moving on uh, in the in the coming week. So uh, we want to we want to bless Dirk as he as he leaves to his new new hometown and a new job and a new house and everything. So uh, so we're going to bless him in that area and just pray with him uh, for that. So so we'll gather up here at the front and then uh, pray with him. And then we're going to have a lekker roomies at, uh, at McDonald's afterwards, just as a, as a, as a farewell. McDonald's. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, what a blessing. Um, well, remember the visitors. There's, a, there's some free coffee there at the back, so, so don't miss out on that. And yeah, enjoy some fellowship with us. That's great. Thank you, guys. Bless you.